Thank you, Leo Charles. Or me. Hello. 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 All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, first in a new kind of coil conversation. I'm uh, pleased and uh, actually a little surprised to see uh, such good turnout. We have uh, over a dozen people here, uh, here and there, wherever the rest of you are, and we're really glad to have you. The purpose of this new kind of uh, COIL conversation is really a, a research development conversation. So one of the things that COIL set out to do was to help researchers find each other, find people with like interests, help researchers improve the quality of their designs and the quality of their work by um, conversation. You know, all of us, uh, one of our sort of slogans at COIL is all of us are smarter than any of us. And we intend to prove that by tossing ideas out, uh, batting them around together, improving the ideas, and, uh, and doing good work. So with that in mind, I invited Adelina Kristova, uh, a doctoral student here at Penn State, who, uh, along with me, and uh, Xiaoyong Hu, uh, is working, developing a research design uh, to look at grouping in MOOCs. And there she is now. We see you, you you've managed to find a connection. That's good. Adelina. Uh, in just a moment, I'll turn it over to Adelina and she'll sort of present for you the initial design. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we might improve that design. Understanding that we're inviting you to get involved in the design stage here today, but also uh, in the study as it rolls out. The study as we see it now is, uh, is large and is uh, ripe for collaboration. So if you would like to get involved in the actual conduct of this study, uh, there's room for that as well. So Adelina, uh, has your, is your microphone available? Are you ready to turn on your mic and uh, take it from here? Uh, the next thing we probably should do is go around and introduce ourselves. Uh, the people in the room are all, we're using the common microphone in the middle, so if you speak up, everybody should be able to hear you. And the people outside, if you have microphones on your computer, we will uh, turn on, we'll share the audio capabilities and you'll be able to speak. I'll call you, I'll ask you to introduce yourself by name so it doesn't get a little chaotic. And then um, if you don't have a microphone out there, you can just type a little introduction to yourself in the chat window uh, on the right hand side of the screen. All right, thanks a lot. So I'll begin, I'm Kyle Peck. I am one of the co-directors of COIL, the Center for Online Innovation and Learning at Penn State. A professor in the College of Education, and let's pass it to my to my left here. Introduce yourself, please. Your mic is right there. Okay. Um, I'm KP Chu. I'm a postdoctoral research associate uh, for World Campus Learning Design down here, and um, we sent an um, email this afternoon about this session. So um, we're working on MOOC project. Um, we're looking at MOOC. And expand and the system um, in relation to the transaction of different theory and how we can um, assess the, the paradigm and, and uh, the learning of students with MOOCs. So uh, we're going to present on that topic um, uh, in this, you know, I think this coming February there is a MOOC forum. Right, February 10th. Yeah. And then also another conference in Harrisburg. And your name again, P K? K P. K P. Two. C H U. Ju. J J J O. Okay. I'm gonna take that in the uh, chat box so we we know uh, have that for my reference later on. Thank you. Suzanne, would you like to introduce yourself now? Sure. Hi everyone. I'm Suzanne Beinert. I'm I think that might be your, your, list, your speakers um, come up. I'm not connected yet. Okay. Go ahead. Suzanne. Anyway, um, PhD candidate. Great. Elizabeth, would you like to introduce uh, yourself, please? I'm Elizabeth White. I'm a postdoc in the psychology department working on um, educational gaming for uh, teens with autism. Great. Brad? Hi, my name is Brad Zdenek. I'm Educational Planning and Strategy Manager for the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And uh, I help to manage and, and run these types of COIL conversations. Great. 
Okay, now we're going to go out to people who are not in the room with us. Uh, we'll come back to you last, Adelina, because you're going to, we're going to turn it over to you, so we'll come back to you last. So, Augustus, would you like to, oh, that's, that's you. Yeah, Augustus is Brad's <laughs> other machine that he uses to monitor things. So I, I, I should have known not to do that. Carla Rapp. Carla, would you introduce yourself, please? Carla may have stepped away. Uh, we're not hearing from Carla at the moment. So we'll skip her. Dave Passmore, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Did any of us have our speakers turn on? Maybe we can't, maybe they're talking and we just can't hear them. Uh, no, should be on. Okay, we're not hearing David either. If uh, if some of you are talking and we can't, we're we're just not hearing you, then please type that in the chat box so we'll understand that. In the meantime, we're going to go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's you. So you're I now in. Okay, I connected so back in. Elizabeth White has, has joined us. She's in person and good. online. Well, Jack. then I can see the screen either. Okay. Jack? Jack is typing. So I think that probably means Jack doesn't have a microphone. Or we're not hearing he's telling us. Oh, Jack Matson. Hi, Jack. Jack Matson is the... He, I'll introduce him a little bit there since he apparently doesn't have a mic. Jack Matson is a professor emeritus in engineering. Uh, his specialty is creativity, and he just uh, led the team that created that ran Penn State's MOOC on creativity, innovation, and change with oh, over 100,000 people registered and a uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful course. And we're really glad to have you here, Jack. Um, Jerry, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. Excellent. I'm Jerry Brzee. I work for Allen Corporation, and my interest is in using this technology in the uh, aviation training discipline that I pursue. And when you say this technology, you mean MOOCs and uh, Matthew yes, Olsen Online Yes. Uh, we have some serious uh, cost effectiveness challenges in aviation training that we're going to face in the next couple of decades. and uh, any kind of a technology lever that can uh, reduce the in excessive cost of getting a commercial pilot ready to go uh, is of great interest to me, and I'm here to learn whatever I can. You guys might as well know Kyle and I have been friends a long time, so that's why I'm crashing your party. That's right. I've been here since 87, and he was here somewhere in the early years of that. You should also know that Jerry's an excellent singer, songwriter, guitar player, but we're not going to go into that right now. <laughs> I'm muting my microphone very quickly. All right. <laughs> Lynn, would you introduce yourself, please? Ah, Lynn just did in the chat box. Thank you, Lynn. Not sure Mike's on. New computer, interested in MOOCs to connect the Commonwealth campus needs for courses. Ah, thank you, Lynn. Patricia Opati Doroshenko, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Patty may have stepped away from her computer at the moment. Patty is an assistant with us at COIL. Uh, she makes lots of arrangements and makes things happen uh, for COIL and other things, too. But since she's not here, we'll stop it at that. Um, Bill, are you ready? Bill may be experiencing problems with his microphone. He just okay. asked if we could hear him. So, Phil, feel free to uh, to type in the chat box uh, rather than use a microphone if you'd like. Bill is typing. Okay, Phil, a doctoral student in LPT. Okay, King Zhang. Is that, did I get that wrong? Uh, how do you pronounce your first name? King Zhang. Okay, can you introduce yourself? Great, nice to meet you. And Suzanne, is that you, Suzanne? Yep. Okay, and then Vicki Hoffman. Vicky 
Pinky and Phil are typing. Phil also works over at ETS on MOOCs and interested in collaborative learning and informal learning environments. Thank you, Phil. And Vicki, Senior Support and Training Analyst for ITS, looking to learn whatever she can in this space. Thank you, we all are. Is there anybody who uh, we missed in the first round of introductions that wants to add an introduction now before I turn it over to Adelina? Okay, hearing and seeing nothing, I will uh, turn it over to Adelina Herstova to introduce yourself and then break into the initial presentation. Adelina? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, really thrilled to see so many people. Can you hear me, everybody? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so, welcome to our uh, CORAL research conversa conversations. Uh, and I'm really excited that we are starting this uh, uh, exciting conversations. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so, uh, we have the, the uh, PowerPoint and Dr. Kyle, Dr. Peck, uh, can you, uh, are you controlling the PowerPoint or Brad? Uh, uh, the outline of the, uh, the PowerPoint Brad. was actually we had the introductions and uh, so, uh, I'm going to present a brief pro uh, project background, and then the next one will uh, share with you the project abstract, and uh, we would like you to uh, to stay with us uh, and uh, uh, and bring your insights about the next step. And uh, this is an open invitation to everybody who is interested in grouping in MOOC and in any any type <coughs> of research on. So how this project started. Uh, it was um, my participation in the wonderful. Um, it seems that there's uh, a bit of an audio issue. We lost Anything your audio else? after next steps. Okay, so um, <coughs> this is an open invitation to, to join the research, and um, so the brief project background uh, started with my participation in the wonderful. Uh, MOOC with um, Jack and Catherine and um, Daryl. Uh, the MOOC that uh, Dr. Peck introduced a, a second ago when we were introducing uh, Jack uh, Madsen. Um, uh, the, uh, the creativity, in innovation, and change. I was participating in several uh, aspects of the of the course, and I was really excited about the uh, all the interest in the MOOC and the Penn State. One of the first, uh, uh, actually, of the uh, first Penn State MOOCs. Uh, it was hundred and plus thousand people uh, signed up for the course, and a lot of activities going on in the social media and Google Plus. Uh, so the interest uh, and the, the question about um, now, okay, so what do we do with this? As a doctoral student in adult education and comparative and international education, so the question was, okay, so... Uh, Adelina, we're, uh, yes. we seem to be having a bandwidth issue from your... Oh. Uh, so you lost me at CS, CSC? Would, would you freeze your video? I think we're having a bandwidth issue from your end. I'll freeze it. So if okay. you just click in the lower right-hand corner. Okay. Go ahead and better? speak, and I think we, I think it'll go Maybe. better this way. Yes. I'm sorry. So is, is it better? Uh, so the, the interest yes. was that, so we had these questions, and I was working with Dr. Peck last semester on an independent study, about okay, so now what do we do with the, with the students who, in a, such a massive amount of um, of participants and numbers, actually not amount, but um, uh, people who are interested and excited. And uh, so we saw that a lot of the um, of the students were searching and going and participating in different 
different parts of the of, uh, of the of the course, but not necessarily in Coursera. There were things in uh, the plus of people were self-organizing. Some of the uh, students felt that there was uh, a bit of uh, uh, looking for the forum discussions and groupings. Um, uh, some, some students found uh, themselves lost in the content of the of a massive amount of forums and discussions. So we, we had this uh, question about, okay, so now let's have and, and see if we can uh, actually intentionally group the students. And these were the, um, the projects and how we decided what to do about it. Uh, so these are the questions we, we started to, to look for. And um, so we uh, have a list of the goals for the study and how to actually what we want to study. Uh, you can read all this and actually uh, um, so the, the main question was okay so if we start the, the MOOC with the grouping at the beginning is this then any is this going to be any value added to the to the learning space for for organizing this uh, the students, or and then then compare if people self-organize or if its instructor uh, made groups are more effective. Uh, actually, we also wanted to address the temp the massive uh, uh, attrition rate in, in MOOCs, and we know that ten percent. Uh, we have 10% in Intelad, I know Jack will say, oh, 10% of the 10,000 uh, students, it's, it's a lot still. And we have reached a lot of, uh, of participants. Uh, still, I think the potential of uh, MOOC is uh, to reach m many, many more thousands and to be successful to the end. So this is how the project started. And uh, I added uh, yesterday under influence of uh, um, of, uh, net with the conversation we had about networking that we would like to, to see if we can test some of the uh, learning theories and the, the newest con connectivist theory actually for the digital uh, uh, era, if we can test this or some of the adult learning uh, theories I, I have been I I'm familiar with and I work with, uh, for example, constructivists, and then compare this learning uh, theory. So this was the, the, the interest in I'm coming from to test some of these uh, theories. And, and then see, because MOOCs represent a lot of data and this is a possibility to test this, uh, I think we, uh, I hope all who is here is as excited as I and Dr. Peck and and uh, and Jack and uh, Dr. Passmore and everybody. Uh, so here, here it is. This is the project we are thinking about, and this is the next step actually. So this is the list we can share with you as uh, what are the questions we are asking and what is the goal for the project. Uh, the most important now is we um, we are inviting you to look with us and see if we if you will be interested in. Um, so next, uh, next slide, please. About uh, applying, working on, and applying together uh, for Coil Spring 2014 project, and the deadline is May 15th. Uh, and so this is the invitation, open invitation to collaborate. And this is the actually uh, the the priorities that we'll be addressing. And these are, um, I think, um, a very important priorities of, of COIL. And I see a lot of potential to, to address this priority. So I'm Thank you. I think I'd like to expand a little bit on the, the study design before we break it into a full-blown conversation just to let you know what we've been thinking. 
So the idea is in MOOCs you get tens of thousands of people and often it appears chaotic and when there is conversation, when there is interaction among students, it seems to be never with the same students. You know, the more students there are in the class, the less likely it is that you'll, you know, really identify with someone and see their work again and, and create a relationship. We know social learning is really important. So what we thought we would do is uh, attach, you know, work with the instructors of a MOOC and create a survey that allows people to specify whether they would like to be grouped. If they would like to be grouped, we wanted to ask them what type of grouping they would like to be in. And some of the things that made sense to us, and we're, we're interested in hearing from you, other variables that might make sense or whether some of these aren't really necessarily good variables. But some might have been things like, you know, English proficiency. You know, if, you're, if you don't speak English as a primary language, maybe you want to be grouped with other people who speak your language. Even if the, the MOOC is offered in English, there might be value in having someone else that speaks your primary language uh, be members of groups so you could hold offline discussions in your native language. Other things might be you might want to take advantage of the diversity that a MOOC brings to the table. So one of the great things about MOOCs is you'll have people participating from 100 and umpty ump countries. You know, maybe 165, I think, is uh, the highest I've seen in, in MOOCs. So maybe you want to take advantage of a MOOC and be grouped with people from other cultures, especially in a, in a thing like creativity or, or in a, uh, a topic such as, you know, uh, well, art. It might be really beneficial to be uh, grouped with contrasting people that are as different as you as possible, perhaps. Then there are other things. So maybe they're uh, in Muslim countries. They would like gender uh, specific groups. And then, so we decided to create some, some grouping variables based on things that might make sense and might contribute to conversation. Or might, if you don't group for it, inhibit conversation. And then we thought there's another variable on top of that, which is the size of the group. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, group size is a really interesting variable in a MOOC because a lot of people sign up and then that funnel narrows very quickly over time. So if you wanted a group of 15 people or 10 people, you probably have to start with a group that's a lot bigger than that and it'll get small quickly, but you can't really predict. And we think that the, the grouping would probably affect attrition. So if you do create an effective group from the beginning and you plan with, with many more people than you think you're going to need and the grouping works, you end up with a group that remains too large as opposed to one that, that naturally gets smaller. So we're thinking of, of doing a study where we allow, ask people to take a survey. From those who do, we take half of those people and assign them to groups, and the other half we don't assign to groups. So we have a control group built right in. So half the people have been assigned to groups, half have not. Of the people who are assigned to groups, we would assign half of those people to groups according to their preference, perhaps, and another half not according to their preference. And then of the people who are assigned to groups, whether in their preference or not in their preference, we would have some people assigned to relatively smaller groups and some people assigned to relatively larger groups. Right now we're thinking ideally we'd like to end up with about groups of 10 or 20. Uh, but again, it's hard to figure out how you would do that. One way is to put everybody in, start with groups of like 25, and then as people become inactive, you take the active people and put from two groups and put them back together. Now, we did some playing around with numbers in an Excel spreadsheet. And if you have a lot of people, which you do in most moves, if you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, you can create lots and lots of groups of each type. So you could still move people who wanted same language groups together. Uh, you know, even after the attrition, you take the small groups and, and combine them. So that's kind of an overview of what we're thinking. So it's about MOOCs. It's about creating conversation, friendships, the social kinds of aspects that we know are important to learning in an instructor light, you know, MOOC kind of a, a situation. Another factor, just to complicate it one more bit before we just throw it open to conversation, is that we're also wondering whether training people about how to work in groups is important. So another potential factor would be to say, you know, here's the kind of supportive, you know, supportive feedback, and here are, you know, different roles that group members might play. Those of you who've followed the uh, collaborative learning 
cooperative learning research, sometimes you assign roles to people in groups. If I'm assigned a role, I might not quit the course because I have a role that people are counting on me to play, for example. So there are other variables that you might you know, consider on top of this study. So with that, uh, I'll ask Adelina if there's anything else that my ramblings have uh, caused her to want to add before we open it to the group. And if I don't hear anything, we'll just go ahead oh, and uh, just to have add a conversation. that. Yeah, We're gonna start we monitoring have so this, many uh, variables and big questions, of course. Go ahead. And just uh, the big questions, and uh, the big questions uh, here now is the, the the logistics about it. So we've started thinking about, uh, and we know that um, Catherine uh, Yablko, um uh, has contacted and is working, I think, with um, with the, the Purdue Group, with Cadme, uh, with the software creators, and of Cadme, and uh, so there is already a, a software that automatically designs uh, uh, the groups, or if somebody else has worked with, uh, or how is the best? We know that um, Angel does this automatically, but it's random. So we want to complicate this group creation based on the survey questions we ask first at the beginning of the semester. So any thoughts about this will be really welcome. Yes. Yeah, can people hear me? Move back. Go ahead and yes, go ahead. Um, I, I really like kind of Christina's idea, and I also like your link, uh, Kyle. You're mentioning of uh, Purdue's uh, group, Catme, because I think one of the elements that I think would be really ideal, really nice, is to uh, offer opportunities for people to do kind of random groupings or some kind of spontaneity. Because uh, I think, especially when you talk about trying to tap into the diversity of MOOCs, I think if you can kind of somehow find linkages between design, HCI, and collaborative learning groups, I think you've got a really kind of awesome potential combination there. Good point. Was that Phil? Yeah, Phil, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Did you want to jump in? Okay. Let's go ahead. Okay. Really. Other thoughts? I've typed mine so everybody can see it. Now say it. <laughs> okay. Um, just a, a thought about career fields because Jack had mentioned um, the aviation field. Uh, so if you got people together with the like minds that could help build upon ideas. But then I realized so many of those it might be too overwhelming. But, but you could science, go with the science, their uh, goals and what they want to get out of the program. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. So another, uh, Elizabeth pointed out, she just, in case you couldn't hear, she said you might want to go with their goals or what they want to get out of the program. One of the MOOC phenomena is that people who just want to look around come in and people who are really serious and want to do this, you know, change professions and become whatever are in there. So you have people with different levels. And so one very good way to group people would be, you know, just put me with other people who are really serious about this. Or people who don't really, aren't really serious about it because I don't want to be. Yeah, that's a that's a really good suggestion too. We also thought about time zones too. So, but but now so maybe I'm a night person, but I'm on the east coast. So maybe it's not so much about time zones as it is about when you're most likely to be active, so that you can have some synchronous real time uh, groups uh, interactions as well. Other thoughts. Kyle, yeah, this is Jerry. Actually, can you hear me? Yes, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, suggestion to the folks participating. If you're not talking, mute your microphone because it's picking up typing noises and that's that's hammering the bandwidth. So I'm gonna I'll mute and uh, I'll mute now. Thanks, Jerry. So your microphones here are uh, based upon um, or um, something different from the 
what we have now, you know, with the different education research or other open learning literature. Uh, is that what you were uh, hypothesizing with your research questions or something specific to MOOCs? I don't, I don't think it is specific to MOOCs. I, I guess the basic hypotheses we would be, we would be running with are that grouping will, first of all, our dependent variables that we care about initially are uh, attrition. Mm -hmm. So grouping would reduce attrition. Grouping would increase student-student interaction. Uh, grouping would, in to some extent, substitute would increase interaction, which would substitute for the absence of professor. So we're not really proposing that that MOOCs are, well, I guess they are. I, I guess I'm going to rethink that because they are different in that in in a regular course you don't have such a diversity of, of students. You don't have high school students in with senior citizens. You don't have people uh, who barely speak English in with those who speak proficiently. You don't have people without the prerequisites for the course. Mm -hmm even stepping into the course. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's so much uh, diversity uh, that perhaps I should be making a case. That's a good point. Perhaps I should be making a case that MOOCs are different. And although grouping is important in face-to-face, uh, -face, in traditionally sized circumstances, they're even more important in mm -hmm. these massive courses because of the, not only because of the massiveness, which is the case I made originally, but also because of the openness, which brings the diversity. So there's no, no application, so anybody can jump in. So, yeah, so that's a good point. Thank you. That was KP talking, by the way. If you didn't, uh, if you couldn't tell. Are you going to be able to track the people who don't want to be grouped as another subgroup of the sample? Yes. Because you would still have the same outcomes in terms of what they do in the class and their performance. Right. And so stuff too, right. Yeah, so there'd be there's all kinds of data that come through, and they come through in ugly ways that require a lot of work. But we do get data files on every every time they log in, how long they're there, every click they make, every uh, every post they make, every bit of feedback they give. Everything is recorded. But you know, it's it's not tied to a student name, mm -hmm. so it's tied to a code, and the code changes every time you come in. But there's a way. This is one of the things that makes it ugly. So we're, we're I'm talking now okay. about the uh, data, the negative attributes of the data as collected by the Coursera MOOC. So this is Coursera MOOCs. It, it, other platforms probably don't have all these limitations, but it still is possible to understand which student. You can still match all of the different <coughs> events for one student. You can bring it back together, but it's not, it's not trivial, especially when you have hundreds of thousands of people. So, but we have a great, we have a team that's working on that and they're in collaboration with other teams that are working on that. So progress is being made there. Yeah, so the idea would be you'd see what people, ungrouped people, what their attrition rates are and how many projects they turn in and how many, uh, how much feedback they give and how many forum posts and maybe even words per forum post and things like that. I wonder how you can actually control, you know, the work working uh, variable other than a grouping or, or the personal uh, learner's characteristic and their contact environment there is a difference <coughs> uh, which may impact significantly on their attrition or retention but, and so so the the question i i don't think so uh, the question may not be controlling those it might be uh, separating those out so let's suppose we have I, I tempted to jump to my spreadsheet, but if you can just imagine, let's say there were 60,000 people in the course, and you're dividing half of them into groups. So now you've got 30,000 people who get divided into groups, and you're using 10 different types of groups. Well, you still got 3,000 people in each type of group, and you're doing groups of 10 and 20. And so you got, you know, so you, you end up still with lots of groups. So it could be that if you if you hypothesize that there'd be a difference between, like based on say highest level of education mm -hmm. attained and you should be able to pull from all those groups. One of the reasons we want a lot of groups is when you, when you think about ends, you know, the number of subjects you need, it's one thing when you're working with individuals. You know, you get statistical power from 15 to 25 individuals. But if the phenomenon is really a group thing, instead of wanting 15 to 25 individuals, you want 15 to 25 groups. If you're going to, you know, if you're going to 
accumulate the work of those groups because those groups could all operate differently. And so it's not so much about how many individuals you have, it's about how many groups you have. Question? Sure. As well as Adelina <clears throat> asked to uh, recap some of the. Why don't you jump in and, uh, and, and uh, comment here? First, uh, too is, much of you, but... is the audio coming through okay? A couple of people are saying that uh, can't hear very well. Okay. I'm going to assume that, that things are getting better. Um, one, one of the things that, uh, that stood out to me uh, here that, that was brought up was, uh, was Jerry talking about the different types of attrition and the types of attrition that have very little to do with groups or grouping. Uh, mentioning the attrition due to diverse entry levels, because of poor delivery, because of isolation, because of distracting external circumstances, uh, having very little to do to do with grouping as a whole. I, I guess the question would be, what do you think of that as far as their role of grouping in attrition would have a significant effect or a, or a, you know effect only on the periphery? Yeah, I got a follow up question that might help too. Go, Jerry. If I'm in a group, who do I get to talk to? Well, the way I would I would see this study working, you would talk to the people, other people in your group. Okay, so we got thirty thousand people in the course, and I have a group of twenty, and those are the people I get to interact with. That's my inclination. Okay, I'm not I'm not married to that, but see, one of the th what happens is when you don't when you let people interact with the whole twenty thousand. I mean, it, it, so there's one thing to view the yeah, work of 25. Yeah, and you don't you don't hear from the same person twice. So if there's really an advantage to to a social, if learning is largely social, and if you build a, a relationship that allows you to be more honest or be more supportive or whatever, then there's no there's no real building of relationships if you're talking once to people, you know, to random subsets of this big population. So that's but again, that's something to be tested. Right. Yeah, I, I can see that. And I can also see some applications uh, where you need to, to bring a lot of people up to speed quickly, but they're going to function in teams. And if their job function or their, you know, their, their post course function is going to be team oriented, this begins to make a lot of sense. And, and Jerry, one of the one of the personal reasons I believe teams might work is and might curb attrition is that if I'm a member of a team and somebody's counting on me for something, I'm not as likely to just say, forget it, I'm too busy. Because I, I kind of owe somebody, you know, they've they've given me feedback, I owe them feedback, right? It's exactly so what I, I, I was feel thinking. kind of an obligation. Yeah, and I feel an obligation I don't feel if I if I'm not grouped. So I think that you know it might be that grouping for certain things makes sense, but allowing people the you know the ability to go out and play in the, in the ocean. It's like maybe you have this uh, the side pool, uh, the hot tub pool off to the side where you interact with your groups, and you have the big swimming pool where you can go out and see what everybody else is doing and and benefit from the diversity and and uh, you know just sample. Uh, but the ability to come back and have somebody that I know. To talk about it with seems seems like an advantage, but Vicky just brought up a, a very interesting point. I don't know if you if you see that there. As far as uh, attaching metadata to discussions that are happening, so you can do grouping on the fly, uh, type of dynamic grouping. So rather than focusing on the development of a community, developing uh, in, uh, a way or a method to keep someone actively. that are interested. So rather than having that personal connection for coming back, it's more of an engagement issue. That's really uh, a, good, a good point. I agree. Anybody else want to talk about that? I don't want to do too much of the talking here. How do people self-organize? It's beginning to sound like... Like what is the grouping that they, they would naturally self -select do? self-select for interest. Group? Yeah, and the, what what happens in MOOCs, groups have sprung up. They're usually place-based. 
So people usually say, hey, is anybody in Denver you know, working on this? Is anybody in Tokyo working on this? And that, you know, that could be just because they have the ability to actually come together physically, and many groups do that, but it also could be time zone and language and, and the ability to see each other physically. So most of the spontaneous groups that we've seen, now, there are other things too. So like uh, in the art MOOC that we ran here at Penn State, they created a Facebook page for the course, and then people could join the Facebook page for the course, and then they met each other there and got to know each other and could link out to the profiles. And so they had more uh, ability to form relationships through that. So, so I guess some are place-based and some are probably Facebook-based uh, or online tool-based groups. I think they... Um, we Vicky's had... Uh, Go ahead. Oh, um, so in the... Um, CIC um, uh, course with uh, Jack um, and um, Catherine and uh, Daryl, we had like self-organizing groups migrated actually out of the Facebook, uh, out of Coursera. Coursera was um, a bit of uh, too much for many. Thank you. You know what I, I uh, Okay. Whenever we have a collision uh, of voices, we're going to stop and yield to the person who's not in the room uh, because they, they don't have the same opportunities and cues that we have. So uh, if, if there's a collision, a vocal collision, the right away goes to the person who's not here. All right, but so I, I, Vicky's comment about the uh, attaching metadata and grouping on the fly is really interesting because maybe it's not so much about being in a group that I that I connect with time after time. Maybe it's being able to interact with somebody right now, or maybe that's equally or more powerful. So you know how in some systems you can see who's on right now, see which friends are online. Like Skype, you can tell which of your contacts are online. If we were to put something like that together. Or you can take these groups and overlay Skype the ability to see group members. But then again, the more people you have that are online at a time, the more likely it is that there'll be others online when you're online. So I'm also thinking about a product called Piazza.com, which is designed to support large classes. And it's a place where students who have questions can ask questions, and then other students can vote those to the top, and people can answer questions, people can vote the answers to the top. And what happens when you're in a MOOC, you have so many people out there that that conversation can happen really quickly. Because if you have 30,000 people at any one time, there might be 2,000 people that are online. And so you ask a question, boom, you get an answer. And so there's, there's more interaction there with a tool like that. So maybe another either twist on this study or another study that might be proposed would be one that, that finds a way to allow the people who are online to see and interact with each other at that same time. Now, it's about being online and on the same piece of the course at the same time, too. So it's like where you are, who else is working on this chunk right now with me, and can we talk? I think that would go a long way, too. Yeah, regarding that social social pretense, uh, that there. I think there is a pre um, amount of research on social presence and uh, the number of groups uh, which is effective for online learning. And uh, the, the you know previous literature says it it shouldn't be no more than five people to interact actively in, uh, as a group. 
uh, in online education or learning. And then MOOCs are, I mean, the, the learning environments are different, but it, it really depends on what kind of um, interaction you are looking at uh, and what, how you pose your dependent and independent variables for uh, your invest investigation. And uh, I can, I'm not sure at this moment, you know, how you can make the link to the attrition because of that reason. There are so many different, you know, um, variables either in time and uh, current research that some of the some of the research goals how you pose there um, in online and distance education context. But I I I would be really interested in uh, seeing if you find any meaningful uh, outcome from this project, uh, which is specific to MOOC, and right. then uh, in, uh, draw uh, that can draw implications for uh, MOOC design. That would be wonderful. Other thoughts? If you're if you're interested, I know some of you people are some people are coming and going. If you're interested in getting involved in extending this conversation, maybe participating on a research team, uh, please indicate that in the chat box uh, at some point. You don't have to do it right now, but make sure that we we capture the, the fact that you're interested. And if you don't hear from us in about a week or so, then go ahead and email me or Coil. Uh, and let us know that you're interested in participating because we know that this one conversation today isn't going to answer all our questions. It just sort of plants the seed of this idea. So if you're interested in participating, collaborating, we'd like to know that as well. See the chat. Very raises the point of a, a shared goal. My thought is that groups need a reason for being. And if you simply say, okay, you 10 people are gonna be a group in this MOOC, my first response as a potential student would be, so what? If you tell me you 10 people are gonna be responsible uh, for something, for some contribution, for some product, for some, uh, to meet some criterion, and you do it together and help each other, all of a sudden I say, okay, I get it. This is my support structure. This is how I'm gonna survive in this 30,000 sea of students. Good point. You could even test different reasons for being uh, a group. I think the reason is everything in terms of making it effective. So off the top of my head, I mean, the, the reason I would, if I were being, you know, totally open and honest with them, I would say to them, you know, having others to talk to about a course has been proven to, you know, enhance learning and enhance people's interest in and uh, persistence in a course. People talk to each other. Which is what but, a good... But I, I, don't, I bet there's better ways to... Uh, well, well, that's what a good graduate program does. It, it pulls a group of people together and focuses them on a common goal and keeps them from getting lost. Good point, Jerry. The conversation is going on in the chat box. So we have... Uh, created a Google Doc that has a uh, description of the project that will be evolving. Uh, I'm going to add it to the chat box. I know that you haven't been um, you haven't been authorized to go there, but if you send if you try to go there, I think you can ask permission. So I'm going to put that uh, the address of that Google Doc in the chat box, and if you would like to see it, it's got a a better description of the project, which is part of what was uh, in the advertisement for today's session that you may have already seen. But I'll, I'll put it in the chat box because 
you, there's a little more there, and also that will evolve over time. So if you want to check back and see, well, you know, what's going on and how the project is changing, you're welcome to do that. So let me just find that. Also, I'd like to say that if you're interested in doing other research uh, around the idea of MOOCs, Penn State is developing a process that, that through which you can do that. So the, the process involves uh, going online and filling out a form that says, I'm interested in doing MOOC research. This is, these are my research questions. This is, you know, so you, you know, here's who I am and so on. And you basically submit a request. And then there's a team that will look at the research requests. And then if you want to be attached to a specific MOOC, then this, this team will uh, approach the professors who are running that course and will help introduce you and sort of foster a discussion uh, between MOOC researchers and, and uh, MOOC offerers. So if, if you have an idea for a study you'd like to propose, um, let me know and maybe I can put the, I don't, I don't know, it would probably take me a little longer than I would want to do right now to find that link and put it in the uh, box. You, you don't happen to know where that is, Brad, do you? Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. So uh, I'll, I will find that and I'll, I'll put it in a, we'll, we'll publish a link to this recording and I will put the link to the form for submitting MOOC research in the thing that has the link to this recording. So that's how you'll be able to find it. I may just try, when this conversation ends, I may try and put it in right now. So it'll be at the end of this recording. That's a hard way to find it too, to get to the end of a, a long session like this in a recorded video online. So you'll be able to find it at uh, coil.psu.edu and it will be under the, uh, there'll be a heading over the next few weeks saying recording available for this uh, topic and uh, Kyle will place it under there. I was wondering if it's even Yes, go ahead. Kyle? Uh, this is Phil. I have, I have one kind of uh, very basic question. Do you happen to know off the top of your head if there are a lot of MOOCs out there that offer the opportunity for participants to create profile pages? Because I'm wondering if that can possibly also be considered a resource for people that self-organize. I don't know, but we have a lot of groups. other people here. Maybe they know. Maybe Does anyone know of a, a MOOC platform that encourages the creation of a profile page? Including real names? Right. Including real names and real bios and things like that. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't, as a student, you wouldn't want to... Put your own real name and bio out there. Because that does it does happen in online courses and it does happen in you know, other places. Uh, we most of us have a a public persona and a private persona. I wouldn't necessarily put my you know well, I would put my bear making out there and other things like that. But some people would you could probably say enough that might be of interest. Well, in the that. video game space, people just make up whatever they want their yes. name to be. So you can make up a nickname if you don't want to use your real name. Right. That's a good point, too. Identity is only important if you need to certify something. What, what Phil was going for was cares. that if I, if I found somebody interesting. Somebody gave me some feedback. And I thought, wow, you know, that's an interesting person. Now, notice, for example, how we're following people on, uh, you know, on Facebook and so on. So I, I've been thinking that it would be really good to find somebody like you and follow them as they find other MOOCs and as they learn things and as they post and so on. So I think there is the equivalent of friendship somehow or, or, or uh, you know, that closeness that grad students create in a face-to-face -face environment. I, if you're going to create that, then somehow I think you need to be able to connect to somebody. And maybe it's right. Maybe the yeah, that's a good it. point. So identity it's is not important, the name that but authenticity to isn't necessary. So it's, uh, you could have some other person, some other flag under which you fly your attributes, I guess.
we've all heard the stories about. Uh, Would you like to share some of my <laughs> <laughs> no, I've just heard stories. I've never participated. I have nothing to offer firsthand. Although I did require all the people who worked for me at one point some years ago, I said, if you've never, if you've never looked at a fate, you're required to set up a fate of a second life identity and find out what this is all about. I don't think anybody did it. But um, it, was a, they it was a thought. They actually preferred uh, separating their Facebook space from you know, the, the educational space such as MOOC. So once they organize Facebook group, it's no more MOOC group. It's like an interest sharing group, something like that, expertise group. And can you still consider that, you know, a, a MOOC group or something networking groups among MOOC participants? So the, the primary purpose is not actually to complete the course. It's to consolidate their knowledge and develop their network. And mm -hmm. uh, does it really affect the attrition and retention of moves? Or so that it might actually increase it if, if a group of people got together and said, "Hey, you're interested in this. I'm in, I, I'm interested in that too." The MOOC's not really going there. Let's go off and do that on our own. And how does that affect the pedagogical process uh, provided by MOOCs? That's one of the questions. So um, there are a whole bunch of numerous, you know, variables uh, surrounding this issue. I think, as long as you design the, the, the research uh, considering those you know, uh, bunch of variables, I think this is really interesting because it's specific to books in all these uh, distance education research. Other thoughts before we wrap up? We've been uh, close to an hour now. Uh, I don't want to stop the conversation prematurely. I appreciate the uh, insights that have been shared and the advice given, and I hope that some of you will consider working with us um, as this project moves on, and I hope some of you will consider proposing your projects. And if you found this valuable, uh, bringing your projects to the table and thinking with, uh, about them with other people. Uh, trying to grow them and, and benefit from the uh, from the group. Adelina, I see you came back on. Would you like to say some uh, words in closing? Yes, thank you so much for all the insights and the comments and suggestions, and we hope to see you. And uh, to work with you. Um, with you, who is everybody. I see Vicky interested. asked a question Thank before you again. we leave. I just want to bring that to the group because others have a great may weekend. Know. I don't know. Uh, she asked, Do you know of any research that's been done around self organizing? Uh, maybe self organizing groups? Uh, what characteristics do people tend to use when they self organize? I think the, my only answer would be what I, I said to Elizabeth before that uh, the groups I'm aware of were sort of geography based and language based. Um, and I, I don't know of any others. Does anybody else have something they can add to uh, answer Vicky's question? Yeah, if you're talking about self-organizing well, groups I bet in there's MOOCs, some data you know, I don't, there's not get out so of the data, there's not a lot out there yet. But one of the good things that's happening now too is we're starting to build connections between our you know, network here at Penn State and the people at Stanford and the people at uh, Carnegie Mellon and North University of North Carolina. You know, there are different uh, clusters of MOOC researchers that are starting to share what they know and think together about these things. So, all right, well, I'll thank you very much and uh, I guess I'll call a formal meeting to a close. Uh, if anybody wants to stay and talk, we can do that, but uh, I think we'll probably shut it down and, and uh, send you off into a weekend, or or I'm sure you'll all have to scurry back to your desks and get another half hour of email done. Maybe that's more likely. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.